Praise God. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And obviously, uh, you look on the platform and you kind of get an idea of what we're going to be talking about a little bit today. And of course, see me dressed up in a suit like this. I told somebody recently, I said, uh, well, they, they asked me in the back room, they said, well, Pastor, you're kind of dressed up today, aren't you? I said, well, yeah, it's true. I normally don't come to church on Sunday dressed like this unless there's a wedding or a funeral. Come on, somebody. And I said, well, both, you, know, you know what they both have in common, a wedding and a funeral? Somebody's dying in either one of them. Come on, somebody. You either, come on. You either got to die to yourself. Come on. I got I to gotta clarify that, y'all. Not a bad thing, okay? Not a bad thing. You got to die to self in one, and you're just dead on the other. Come on now. God is so good. Amen. But, but God's word is, is awesome. Uh, if, if you're there, John chapter 2, we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 11. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Praise God. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to, to her, mother, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to do to you, do it. Turn to the person next to you and say, just do it. Yes. Come on, we're talking Nike here. Just do it. Now there were, there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of the purification of the Jews, um, of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some of it now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the drunk, and when the drunks, and when the guests, <laughs> I feel some of y'all out there, I mean, the rest of the drunks, okay, no. <laughs> he said, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior you have kept the good wine until now. The beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. This is the beginning of signs and manifested his glory. Everybody say manifested his glory. Amen. And his disciples believed in him. Amen. And his disciples believed in him. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. Father God, we know, Lord, that you're the God of the impossible. We know that miracles still happen. And Father, we just praise you and thank you, Lord God, that you may manifest your glory in this house this morning. And Father, meet us where we are in our faith. And Father God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father God, for saving us, for healing us, and now speaking to our hearts. And we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, every time I read this story, every time I read this passage of scripture, it brings, brings back kind of a little story I've heard a while back. There was a, 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 a deacon that was actually driving down the road, and he was kind of swerving a lot while he was driving, so a police officer pulled him over. And of course, uh, when, he, when he came up to the window, he said, can I have your registration and your license? And he said, sure, officer, is there a problem? He goes, well, you were swerving pretty bad back there. And he said, well, you know, and, and, and then of course, he looked at it, and he noticed there was just a, a bottle there. He said, what is, what's in that the container? He goes, well, it's just water. He goes, oh, really, can I, can I see it for a moment? So he grabs the water and he goes, wait a minute, this is wine. He said, oh, praise the Lord, Jesus did it again. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I think he still got the ticket. Come on now. <laughs> See, there's a word that totally disables and deactivates our faith. It's a word, it's a situation, that, it's a mindset that we have to be very careful with. See, this mindset robs us from living the life that God really wants us to live. See, this adversary and this attitude that I'm talking about to you this morning is the word unbelief. Unbelief. I don't think there's anything more that hurts the heart of God when his children don't believe. Don't believe his word. See, I don't know about you. When somebody tells me something, if I believe it, then I believe it, then I trust them. If I don't believe what they say, that's a sign of mistrust. 
So when we look at God's word and look at his promises and see what he has to say, God just says, listen, I'll do the heavy lifting. I'll do the hard stuff. You just have to believe. If you believe, it enables me to do everything I say that I can do. And if you believe that, you'll see all kind of wonderful changes happen in your life. You see, unbelief caused the 12 Israelite spies to come back with a bad report, or at least 10 of them did. Unbelief turned that 12-day trip. Do you realize it would have just taken 12 days to get from where they started to the promised land? That 12 days turned into 40 years. They were scouting the land 40 days. If you, look at the, if you study the word of God, they were actually looking through the land for 40 days. That means because of their unbelief, every day they were there cost them a year floating in the desert. How many know sometimes we have to be careful? Come on, somebody. Some folks want to come up for prayer, and, and, and some folks need more of God. And the question I always have to ask myself when I know I'm going through something is, am I believing God? Come on, somebody. Am I trusting his word? Because how many know there are some deserts that we make for ourselves? Come on, somebody. There are some issues that we get ourselves into, and God has nothing to do with it. See, unbelief led Abraham and Sarah to take the promise of a son into their own hands. And because they did that, they didn't birth Isaac, they burned an Ishmael. Come on, they birthed an Ishmael. How many know if you get ahead of God, come on now, God wants to give you an Isaac, you may end up with an Ishmael. And when you end up with an Ishmael, you got issues. Come on, somebody. Even to this very day, that battle is still going on. If you read about the lineage of Ishmael after that, that's where a lot of the Muslim countries come from, from that lineage. And that's where the big disagreement is. Wait a minute. Jesus, he's, I mean, uh, 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 Abraham is the, is the promised one. No, no, no. Ishmael or Isaac, you know, they, there's a whole conversation that still goes on today to find out who it is that really claims the land. That's the battle you see on television, whether it's Isaac or Ishmael. See, when you birth an Ishmael, all kind of stuff can go wrong on you. Come on, somebody. Because sometimes, how many know that backsliding is bad, but front sliding can be just as bad? Yes. Getting ahead of God is normally the problem we have because we don't, we don't wait on God. The Bible says that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Come on, somebody. So if we wait on God, then God, come on, he'll birth an Isaac instead of an Ishmael in our lives, amen? And then we can walk in victory. If you believe that, put your hands together, give the Lord a praise, because you're the one that's waiting on God. See, unbelief prevented Jesus from doing miracles in Capernaum. Could you imagine the Son of God? There was miracles happening all over, but when he went home, he went to Capernaum. Because they said, oh, that's just, that's just Mary and Joseph's son. The Bible says he could not do one miracle when he was at home. Of course, how many know that a prophet in his own home is, isn't always recognized very well? But because of unbelief that was there, not one miracle happened in Capernaum. Unbelief kept the disciples. They kept the disciples fearful, fearing their lives, even when Jesus was in the boat. How many know if Jesus is in a boat? Come on, somebody. You know you're going to get to the other side. If Jesus is in a boat, there's nothing to fear. Amen? And, and of course, when Jesus is in a boat, you're going to have some good fellowship. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you see, unbelief can cause you all kinds of pain and sorrow. See, I believe that if we're all honest today, we, we admit that we've all wrestled with doubt at times. When things don't work out your way, when you're praying for one thing and it kind of turns the other way and you say, well, wait a minute, God, I was trusting you and, and, and did I do something wrong? And, and you begin sometimes to doubt God and, and his sovereignty. See, that, that can happen to every, any one of us as well. And you see, I remember as a brand new Christian when I first came to Christ the first few months, man, how many of you guys went through a, a hard transition? Some of y'all maybe didn't, but from, a, from darkness to light, come on now, get being in one and getting to the other, that in-between can be a challenge. Come on, somebody. Because God pulls you out of Egypt, right? Now he's trying to get Egypt out of you. God puts us in a process where he starts changing our hearts and changing our minds because he's trying to make us more like his son, Jesus. He's trying to change the image that we have into the image of his son. 
So you see, during that transition, uh, one of the things I went through was a period of loneliness. I went through a period of loneliness because the, all the people I hung out with were all, they, were, they wanted to hang out at the club. Come on, somebody. They wanted to go party, right? That, that's, that's the social group that I had. They wanted to go do this and do that. And I had to realize that if I'm going to follow Christ, I cannot hang around with the same people anymore. I mean, I loved them. I mean, I loved them and I cared for them, but I realized that it was not a good fit. See, some of us have people in our lives right now that are not a good fit. Amen. Come on, somebody. You know, who you know who I'm talking about right now. Amen. See, at the end of the day, we have to be careful. Now, listen, I get it. If they're your family, you can't get rid of them. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> but you got to figure out how to keep them at a distance, right, emotionally, Amen. so they don't come in and jack you all up <laughs> because family... Amen. We'll do stuff like that as well. But we have to be so conscious, so strategic, who we're listening to on a regular basis. You know, relationships. And, and I went through a real financial struggle as well because when I came to Christ, I was unemployed. And I started praying for a job and asking God to help me. So you see, when all that came together, man, I'll tell you what, I was in really bad shape. And it seemed like, now, have you guys ever felt this? It seemed like sometimes the closer you get to God, come on, the hotter it gets. Come on now. All of a sudden, man, if it wasn't going bad, now you're, oh, I'm going to start praying. I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to go to church. All of a sudden, all oh, hell begins to break loose. Come on. All of a sudden, warfare comes on every side because the enemy knows you're getting too close to God. And if you, and if you get close enough to God, everything in your life's going to change. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So you see, I, so I, uh, as a young Christian, I said, man, this going to church thing is killing me. Come on now. I thought it was going. To, I thought I was just getting close to God that was killing me. How many of you know life's just rough in general? Come on, somebody. I mean, life is hard whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. I'll tell you what. I'd rather go. I'd rather go through life with God than without God, because I don't know what anybody else can lean on when they're going through this stuff. But I lean on the everlasting arms, just like that old hymn. Come on now. So at the end of the day, I went through all these changes, and it was difficult. But, man, God began to bless, and, and, and I stayed away from church. And then something happened that was really cool. People just kept calling me. Now, how many know that when you're going through something, the last thing you need to hear is a cheerful Christian on the phone? Come on now. <laughs> Hi, bless the Lord, my brother Carlos. How are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing terrible. That's how I'm doing. At the end of the day, they, but they kept leaving messages on my voicemail. Come on. Somebody, some of y'all remember that, right? The, the recorder. Come on. The little cassette tape in it. Come on now. Oh, don't, don't act like you're not that old. You know what I'm talking about. You've had one of those. So, so they kept leaving these messages, and, and I kept saying, nah, and I just, but little, but they just kept leaving it, and I realized one thing. I had no idea. I doubted where my future was going, but I had no doubt that people cared. And now, how many know that that's a good thing? When you're going through challenges and difficulty, there's nothing better than having someone around you that says, man, I know you're going through it, but I'm just going to let you know I'm here for you. And at the end of the day, that's what really made a huge impact in my life. And, of course, two weeks later, I was back in the house of God, and, and I, was, I was back in my rhythm, you know, and, and, uh, and God's just so, so good. And, and it's unfortunate, though, there's too many Christians that took a break from church and never came back. A lot. I was just talking to somebody earlier about if you guys ever see the Marvel, the Marvel movie, I can't remember the name of it, but, but it's called The End Game. Well, all of a sudden at the end of the movie, everybody begins to disappear. You guys ever see that? Am I the only one that goes to movies? Come on, somebody. I need a little help, y'all. Just say, yeah, Pastor, I saw the movie. So they disappeared. People just started disappearing. The next movie, it was five years later, they showed up. I'm just waiting. I got people three years are starting to show up now. I guess maybe they'll all be back in the next five years. It felt like an end game, right, with this whole COVID thing. But how many know that the house of God is not where we get sick? The house of God is where we get healed. And somebody needs to hear that today because so many people stayed away. You spend an hour and a half here in church. You spend another all these hours at work and at, you know, going to Lowe's and going to, you know, food line. And you're walking everywhere. And it's like, so you think you can't get sick there? That this is the only place? Then people got comfortable. I know some of y'all are watching right now. I'm cool with that. But don't get too comfortable on this, on, this, on this network thing, just watching this on television. Somewhere along the line, we got to get back to the house of God. The Bible says, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. I don't know about you. When they opened the doors, I was sitting right there for the first service, and I just began to weep. 
I began to weep because I love the house of God. I got saved at this altar. Listen, I worship God. My kids have all been raised in church. At the end of the day, I couldn't wait to be back in the house of God because something happens here that doesn't happen anywhere else. I don't care how much you read. I don't care who you watch. You want to watch all these uh, big pastors and preachers on television. Listen, at the end of the day, uh, if you go through a hard time, none of those guys on television are going to show up for you. Come on, somebody. You can't call T.D. Jakes. Yo, T.D., I got an issue, man. Would you mind coming over here and ministering to me? Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Oh, but they preach so good. I know they preach good. I listen to them, too. But I love my pastor because I could turn to my pastor and say, Pastor, I need, I need prayer right now. Like, I'm going through a thing, you know. I mean, somebody just died in my family. We got to do a funeral. We got to do a wedding. I mean, at the end of the day, we need the house of God, and we need to be gathered together on a regular basis. Now, none of this is in my notes. Somebody needs to hear that today. And be encouraged. It's so encouraging when we show up as well. Amen. And see, too many people are they are paralyzed by unbelief and doubt. They get stuck there. See, they say, they say things like, well, I doubt that I can receive any more than I have because my family never has. It almost sounds like, like Gideon saying, hey, listen, I'm in the least of the families and I'm the least of those. So if no one else has ever broken through, what makes me think that I can? Let me tell you what. Let me tell you, can tell you I can tell you why you can because the word of God says I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. But the word of God says you are a child of the living God. And no matter what anybody says, including your family, come on, somebody. Because how many, sometimes family's the first one that says, man, oh, God, you're, ton of, you're doing all that. You're going to that church all the time. You're giving your money. Yeah. You're tithing to the church. Oh, my God, they got you brainwashed. Yeah. Well, guess what? They're giving their money to something else. Come on, somebody. Yeah. They're giving their money to something. They're doing something as well. At the end of the day, they're worshiping somewhere. So you see, God, God wants you to know that you're not limited by where you came from and who your family is. See, uh, unbelief let Sarah and, and, of course, Abraham do all that they did as well. And they say things like, people say things like, I doubt that I can attain a life of joy, love, and peace with all the confusion and chaos that I've caused. See, when you've caused a lot of issues, and all of a sudden God's promises are coming your way, you're like saying, man, I don't deserve that. You know what? You don't. Amen. You don't deserve it. But if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, come on, somebody, that washes away every sin, that covers every problem in our lives, none of us deserve. It's all grace. It's God's unfailing, amazing grace that still reaches out for us. Sometimes we think, eh, man, you know what? I mean, this is great, but I, I just feel really unqualified. I feel very unqualified because I have so many things going on in my life. Really? How many, can I just tell you that none of us are qualified? That at the end of the day, the only one that qualifies us is Jesus. He qualifies the unqualified. As a matter of fact, if you think you're qualified, you might want to check yourself. Come on, somebody. That pride might be sneaking in. The last time I read the word of God, it says, pride comes before the fall. As a matter of fact, the less qualified you feel, the more God can use you. Come on, somebody. That's right, because there's less of you, and there could be more of him. So it's not about your ability. It's about your availability, right? So at the end of the day, just know that God wants to use you and don't have to worry about all these other things as well. See, I, th I doubt that I can really achieve those dreams because I failed so many times. Listen, can I tell you about failure? Failure is okay. Fail forward. Come on, somebody. Learn from where you fail. Fa Listen, fa anybody I've met that's been super successful has had a lot of failure along the way. The difference between failing and succeeding is not quitting. It's not quitting. That, you fail when you quit. But if you get back up, shake yourself off, and go do something else, come on, somebody. At least you've learned what not to do. Amen. And that's a good lesson to have as well, right? Yeah. Praise God. So at the end of the day, there's so many negative things that can come out of people's mouths. And, and it's really sad because unbelief will create mountains. Unbelief creates mountains that only faith can move. And you see, once we start tapping into that faith, and not a lot of faith, just a little, a mustard seed. Have you ever seen a mustard seed, anybody? Amen. Man, it's like a little speck. I mean, it's so small. 
But yet that mustard seed grows this huge mustard plant. God doesn't say you need big faith. He says you need little faith in a big God. A God that can intervene and do what he needs to do in our lives. So we need that faith to get ourselves out of the situations we're in. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 23, it says this. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, and does not doubt in his heart, and does not have unbelief in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Oh, come on, somebody. There's no strings attached. When I read this, I say, well, wait a minute. I have to do this. He says, if you believe, if you don't doubt what you say, what you want will come your way. See, during his earthly ministry, Jesus performed many, many miracles. And you see, the one we're talking about today is the very first miracle that Jesus performs. So he launches his ministry. He's come, it's a coming out party. At the end of the day, sure, there's a a marriage going on, but Jesus is invited to this party, a celebration. And you see, let's go ahead and start filling in the blanks right now because we can learn quite a few truths from this supernatural event, from this marriage that's going to turn into something totally supernatural. And the first thing is this. This miracle was initiated by an invitation. The miracle was initiated by an invitation. Look what John chapter 2, the first couple of verses says. On the third day, now, let's, now that's, that's the third day. That, that shows up a lot in the word, amen? How many of the third day Jesus came back to life? J- third day Jesus shows up at a wedding. Why the third day? Because those folks knew how to party back then. Come on, somebody. It, w- it wasn't just a three-hour reception and everybody went home. It was a week, seven days you would celebrate whenever there was a wedding. I mean, how many know that's a party? I I don't know if people just probably laid around the place. I don't know if they staggered home or what happened back then. They had to get an Uber camel to get them back to the house. (laughs) But they said, so so the third day Jesus shows up, and and this is very interesting too. Do you know in the culture back then that when you got married, the man didn't have to work for a year? Come on, that was kind of cool. Right? We didn't have any checks. They didn't have checks coming in the mail either. The whole village connected with them and helped them. Check that out. Isn't that cool? They did it because they knew the first year of marriage is tough. Come on, somebody. How many, how many married folks can say amen? amen? How many folks are still saying amen 10 years later? <laughs> so the first year, they just stayed home and they connected to their wives. Man, that sounds, that sounds really cool, like a one-year honeymoon. I don't know. That, that might be kind of rough after a while, but praise God, they did it. That's what, the, that's what their culture did. So this was all initiated by an invitation. See, Jesus attended the wedding because he was invited, because he was asked to come. See, if we need a miracle, we must first invite Jesus into our lives. We must first invite Jesus into our circumstances. We need to make an invitation and roll out the red carpet and say, Jesus, I need you in this situation. Amen. And when we invite him to come in, how many know when Jesus shows up, everything begins to change. See, without Jesus, there is no miracle. Amen. You know, I was talking about to Anwar Fazal. Did you guys enjoy the pastor that came? Now, I got to tell you, it was simple what he said, but man, the anointing, I don't know about you, when I was standing up here on this platform, I, I felt the Holy, I thought I was going to fall off this thing. The Holy Spirit was so powerful. And then I found, I know why, because back in Pakistan, they have a prayer, they have prayer 24-7. They pray all day long. They pray constantly, consistently. He says, man, there, people are always knocking on his door for prayer. And I thought, Wow. That was so powerful, so amazing. And he makes an invitation for people to accept Jesus Christ every single time he does it. Because how many know when Jesus shows up, the impossible becomes possible. See, he begins to make a way where there is no way. When Jesus shows up, it changes the atmosphere, the environment changes. All of a sudden, faith rises up. The enemy's got to be scattered. And now you see the power of God begin to move. The Holy Spirit begins to flow. And when he does, come on, somebody, he's going to wreck... Gonna wreck the service. 
<laughs> we just had one of those on Wednesday, y'all. When she, when my sister was was doing that, we had a nice service, and all of a sudden, people just started falling out. Holy Spirit just started moving. Like, wow, that's what I'm talking about. When the Holy Spirit shows up, He just takes over the service. How many know that one touch from Jesus, one touch of the Holy Spirit, is better than ten thousand sermons well preached? Come on, somebody. Come on, give the Lord a praise if you believe that right now. We just need a touch from God. And I know that God did such an amazing thing. You see, when Jesus shows up, sicknesses are healed. Sandra, can I hear an amen? Amen. Chains are broken. Sin is forgiven. Confusion becomes order. Sorrow becomes joy. Death is defeated because we serve a living God. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. See, we serve such a good God and such an amazing God. And when we extend that out in Revelations 3.20, it says this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him. See, when, when, you, when you hear this message, when you hear that scripture, so many, so many times it's actually taken a little bit out of context. But you can get kind of flexible with the actual context on that because most people say that's Jesus trying to knock on the door so that somebody can get saved. But when you read the context in Revelation chapter 3, you find out he's talking to the church. He's not talking to the unsaved in that scripture. He's talking to the house of God. He's talking to the people of the Lord. Because how many know, uh, hallelujah, there's some churches that Jesus is still trying to get into. I'm just saying, at the end of the day, that scripture is, and so, I, so and I'm saying this to say this, yes, God's trying to knock on every one of our doors as people in the church, but yes, it's okay to invite people to the church, come on somebody, to make that invitation, just like Jesus was invited to a wedding and everything changed, guess what, Jesus is invited into this house every single day, come on somebody, and if he shows up and you invite your friend to be in church, come on, they might have an encounter with Jesus that will change their life forever, amen, hallelujah, come on, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, invite everybody. <laughs> invite everybody. I do. I 7-Eleven, I invite people. At the gas station, I got cards. Y'all got your cards? And we get, there, there's some cards out in the lot. Make sure you grab them. And your goal should be to get rid of all those cards by next Sunday. You invite 10 people to church, I guarantee you one will show up. You never know. Just got to keep planting seeds. Allow God to use us just with a simple invitation. See, I I guarantee you, if you invite somebody to church and they come to Jesus, that would be the best invitation they've ever had. The second thing is this. Not only was it initiated with an invitation, it was ignited by intercession. Ignited by intercession. John chapter 2, 3, and says, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. You see, when they ran out of wine, Mary interceded and made Jesus aware, and Jesus honored her request. See, I want you to know that we serve a God that hears your prayers. The Bible says he inclines his ear towards you. See, when you read that, I realize that we serve a God that's awesome. See, when you need, God knows. When you ask, God listens. When you believe, God works. And when you pray, miracles begin to happen. Because prayer is a a supernatural, come on somebody. It is a supernatural occasion. It's a supernatural event that we partake in. It's not just, oh Lord, bless this food, my body, in Jesus' name, amen. Some folks, if they didn't pray that, they they wouldn't pray at all. But thank God that people, at least we pray when we eat, right, amen. Lord, take all the calories out, Lord. Get all the fat out, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Make this cheesecake. Come on, don't let it affect my waistline. <laughs> See, people pray, but do we really pray? Do you pray wanting to connect to God? Taking time. It takes a moment to create an atmosphere. And then begin to just pray. Prayer might just be being quiet. Come on, somebody, for a minute. How, about, how many know that prayer is not just talking? It could be listening. Because I mean, God wants to talk back. He'll speak through his word. 
So you read this word. God's going to speak to you. People say, Pastor Carlos, is it true God can speak to you every day? I say, absolutely. Open your Bible. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Open your Bible and he'll speak to you every single day. Because that's how true God is. Amen. His word is a, a living and active word. And when God begins, when you begin to read his word, you start hearing God speak to you through that word as well. See, I believe prayer should be a constant flow of communication between you and God, no matter what the circumstances. Oh, come on now. So, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You pray anyway. Come on, somebody. Pray no matter what the situation is. Pray whether it's good, whether you're celebrating. It could be a prayer of celebration. Pray when it's bad. Listen, when it's bad, here's a good prayer. Help, Lord. Amen. That's a good, God responds to that prayer. God will show up. It's just that simple. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. We need to pray all the time. And listen, if you only pray when you're in trouble, you're in trouble. You are. See, because a lot of people treat prayer like a spare tire. They only do it when they have a flat. Come on, somebody. We need to be consistent and constant in our prayer lives. So then we do have a situation hit us. It might rock us, but it won't knock us down. Come on, somebody. Because God will prepare you ahead of time and give you the strength that you need in your time of prayer. See, Proverbs 15, 29 says this. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. How many know that prayer changes things? Amen. Not only does it change things... It changes us. See, while you're praying for someone else, while you're interceding about the situation you're in, God is downloading stuff. Come on, somebody. God's in the background downloading information. Down, the, more, the more you stay close, the closer you get to God, the more he begins to download. It's like when I grew up as a kid, I was always saying, I'm not going to ever be like my dad. Like my dad was rough. Come on, somebody. I don't want to ever be like him. And then many years after that, when I grew up, my mom said, man, you're just like your father. <laughs> Some of y'all have said that. Some of y'all have heard that. Come on. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the more time you spend with someone, the more you become Amen. like them. Amen. Come on. We have, we have relationships. You may have a relationship where you can finish each other's sentences because you, you, oh, you talk so often, you know where the person is going, and you can almost finish their sentences. And that is such a powerful thing because, listen to me, when you speak like God, you speak for God. Oh, somebody needs to hear that right now. When you're, when you're proclaiming God's word, come on, somebody, you're speaking God's word, you're speaking for him. Mm. Somebody needs to get a hold of that right there. Begin to pray God's word and God's promises. Because whatever God says, when you say it, come on, somebody, you are his child. You are a child of the living God. You are the heir to his throne. Listen, at the end of the day, we are children of the most high God. Can you look in the mirror and say, listen, I know I'm all jacked up. I got issues. I got problems. But I'm saved. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. God doesn't use me in spite of my problems. He uses me because I'm all jacked up. He wants vessels that are imperfect so that he can get all the glory. Amen? Amen. You see, God is moving constantly in our lives. And I remember, I, remember uh, I, was, I was invited to speak at a church probably about five years ago. And uh, so five years, so, so I got invited to speak at the church. It was on Broad Street, had a great service. The Holy Spirit moved. It was a wonderful time. And, uh, and of course, after the service, I prayed. And we just had, a, I mean, it was just glorious. God just showed up. Do you realize two years ago, I was at the thrift store. And all of a sudden, this young lady comes up to me, all excited. Uh, I'm like, I, like I, didn't rec I don't even know who she was. So she said, Pastor Carlos, Pastor Carlos, oh, my God, I can't believe it's you. I said, okay, we work here. <laughs> this is the, our thrift store for the ministry. So I was kind of how many of you take a step back sometime? <laughs> There's not a lot of crazy people out there. You never know, right? So I just said, well, let me just take a step back from this girl just for a moment. Keep my distance. She's like, well, I got to tell you the story. She goes, Remember that service that you went to? It was on a Friday night. It was on West Broad Street. It was like five years ago. Remember that service? I said, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember this. I know exactly who the pastor is. She said, well, listen, I was there. See, I was there in that service. And you preached. I can't even tell you what you preached that night. 
And I told her, well, neither could I. <laughs> five, that was five years ago. I had no idea what I preached. But she said, but when you began to pray, something began to shake on the inside of me. You see, I was a heroin addict for 10 years. And I didn't know how to shake it loose. I was bound up. I was all messed up. She said, and somebody told me about to come to the church that, and I really didn't want to go to that church, but somebody told me to come, and I, I decided to come. And, of course, you were there ministering. And when you began to pray, something began to shake on the inside. Pastor Carlos, I got to tell you, five years I've been clean. Five years I no longer use heroin. I got so filled with God that day. The chains were broken. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your praise to the Lord. See, you never know what your prayers can do. You never know what happens when you begin to pray in any setting, any setting at all. And you see, that's why we need to continue to pray, continue to build up what God is doing inside of us because we never know. Number three is this. Implement the instructions. Follow the instructions. See, God, in many cases, when God does a miracle, he'll always give you an instruction. Before the, the soldier in the Old Testament, before he could get healed, Jesus said, go dip yourself in the Jordan seven times. Amen. He dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, and he came up healed. Come on, somebody. See, Jesus gave instructions in many cases, and I believe that following those instructions, come on, somebody, was exercising your faith to believe, right, and to step out and do what it called you to do. Because the Bible says faith without works is dead. Faith without action is dead. So God's going to call you to do so. It may take you out of your comfort zone. But listen, if God tells you to do it, just do it. Come on, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Just, do it. just do it. John chapter 2, verse 5, and it says this. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. See, at the wedding, Mary told the servants to do what Jesus asked them to, asked them to do. Jesus asked them to fill the pots with water. And guess what they did? They filled the pots with water. You see, that obedience began to start the chain reaction for this miracle. See, it all initiated with an invitation. It, it was ignited by intercession, but now it's being implemented by following the instructions that God has given, uh, this, uh, Jesus gave these people here. Listen, obedience is the seed for divine favor. And obedience, listen, obedience is the only real evidence of your faith. Oh, just because you go to church, praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Oh, the Holy Spirit moves. Ooh, I got chill bumps, yo. Whoa. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> At the end of the day, faith is evidence when you obey God's word. Amen. If you're walking in disobedience, I got to check your faith. Because yeah. we're not trusting God. How many know that faith that actually following instructions in this case shows that we trust even when we don't understand, we'll still do it. Why do you do it, Pastor? I don't know. God's word says to do it. I don't know what the outcome's going to be. I don't know what it is. But God said do it, and I'm just going to do it. We start thinking about it, trying to analyze what God is trying to do in our lives. How many know that God is, come on, God's higher than we are. His thoughts are higher than ours. Everything's higher. So he sees, he sees from a zoomed out view. But we're here stuck in the weeds. Come on, somebody. He's looking from a higher place, and he's looking at what's happening around you. So listen, you may not see where you need to go, but God does. Come on. And if he says move, you move. Be like Moses. He said, listen, God, I'm going to move, but unless your pillar of fire moves at night, unless the cloud moves at day, I'm staying right here. I'm staying put until you move first. So many of us grab God by the hand. Hey, God, God, I got a great idea. Come on. Here, let me take you. Let me... Let me show you what I'm doing. Come here, God. Follow me. Come, come here and bless my mess. See, I'm trying to get this done, get this done, get this done. He goes, well, that, that's a really good idea, but it's not a God idea. I mean, God can do more in a split second than we can do our whole lives. Come on, somebody. See, what we don't understand is we're trying to figure out our own plan. God says, you don't need your own plan. I've already got your plan. Line up with my plan. Come on, somebody. I'm going to get you further, uh, faster, further than any way you could ever imagine on your own. The instructions, the instructions. It's like the, pa the businessman that came to his pastor. He said, pastor, man, my business is doing terrible. He says, really? The pastor asked him one question. Do you tithe? Come on. Wow. 
So the, the businessman said, well, no, not really. He goes, well, I can't pray for you because you're walking in disobedience to God's word. Come on, somebody. If you're walking in disobedience, I can pray till the cow comes home. Until you start lining your life up with my word, then you're kind of cursing yourself, right? So the guy said, okay, God. So he began to tithe. He said, okay, I'll take, I'll take your challenge. He started tithing. Six months later, his business exploding. I mean, it's flourishing. It's growing. I mean, it, it, the customers are coming in by the groves. So, so six months later, he has a meeting with his pastor again. He says, pastor, I'm having a real issue now. He goes, well, what's wrong? He goes, my tithes check. It's got commas and zeros. Come on, somebody. I said, I'm having a hard time writing that check. He said, no problem. Stop tithing. You'll be poor. You won't have to give up your check anymore. Come on, somebody. At the end of the day, when you think about being obedient to God, God's, listen, obedience has its rewards. Now, you don't have to wait to to get to heaven. Come on, somebody. I love that song. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing. Right? How about we rejoice now? Hallelujah. How about we walk in his principles now? How about if we can walk on this planet blessed, highly favored, moving in what God wants, prosperous. That word's in the Bible. Come on, somebody. Prosperity is in the Bible. A lot of folks say, oh, you're preaching that prosperity gospel. No. Let me tell you what prosperity is. It's when God gives you everything that you need to fulfill your purpose on this planet. Some of us might need a little more. Come on now. Some of us may not. You know, I had this great conversation. I was invited to uh, Liberty University when my daughter Alana was going there. How are we doing, Tanya? Yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, and so I got invited on this panel, and I thought, oh, this is a setup right here, y'all. This is a setup. So, so uh, uh, what's, what's the, the son's name? Uh, Jonathan Falwell sitting there, and he brought with him his New Testament professor, department head. I thought, ooh. And then me, <laughs> myself, on this side, come on, come on, spirit fill, come on. We, we all, you know there's going to be a thing. You, y'all, you already know where you think it's going to go. And there was another brother pastor, black gentleman from Lynchburg. We're just sitting there, and all of a sudden, I'm just waiting for the questions. I had already lined up all my speaking in tongue stuff. Come on, somebody, just in case they went there. The students started asking questions, and they talked about the prosperity gospel. And of course, you know, they start talking about certain pastors that we know because they're prosperous. And they say, well, Pastor Carlos, what do you think about this prosperity gospel? I said, well, I'm not really sure. But for some reason, every time I drive on this campus, you're building more. There are buildings. Have you you guys ever been to Liberty University? You can't get through the place without detours, and they're building, and more buildings. I'm talking about giant buildings. I said, so, you know, every time I drive through here, it takes me forever to get around all the detours. You guys are building and building and building. I I, I think that looks a little prosperous. All right. Come on, somebody. I said, I I think, I mean, you know, I I think the campus, when I look at this, I think the value of all these buildings and everything you have, I I think that looks like prosperity to me. Amen. All right. Everybody got quiet. Come on, somebody. Uh That's right. I I almost went there with his car. I saw the car he drove. Wow. But I said, nah, let me not go personal on this one. Yeah. I saw the car you drove in, bro. Uh Prosperous. All right. Amen. I said, I said, you know what? I said, the reason you're prosperous in this college is because God called you to educate the next generation of Christians. And all um, all the money that's coming in here that people are donating so you can build these beautiful buildings is to educate. So you need more than the average person. You know everybody got quiet? That's a a Holy Ghost moment. Come on, somebody. That's one of them Jesus lines. He said, let he who has no sin cast the first stone. Let he who has no prosperity talk trash about others that do. Amen. That's right. <laughs> oh, I don't know why I went there. Anyway, come on. All right, let me get back on this. Praise God. We're coming in for a landing. Implement instructions. Utilize, okay, the fourth thing is this. Utilize common instruments. 
utilize common instruments. John chapter 2 verse 6 says, Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. That means somewhere between 120 to 180 gallons of wine. How many know you can have a pretty good party with that much wine? <laughs> See, but the Lord uses instruments to perform his miracles. That day he used pots with water. At, at, when, when there was a hungry crowd that were listening to him speak, and that day he used five loaves and a couple of fishes. See, with the blind man, he used saliva and dirt. You see, God does things, and he uses common things to do uncommon. Yeah. Come on, somebody. See, God uses the common to do something uncommon. So we need to know that when God begins to move, he turns something that was just ordinary and he made it supernatural. Come on, somebody. Amen. See, God also uses the ordinary vessels to also do extraordinary things. He uses the common. See, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says this. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are fragile and we are broken. And we're just vessels in the hands of the potter. Come on. At the end of the day, God wants to use every single one of us. See, because God will use whatever you surrender to him. See, whatever you surrender, God will use. See, it may seem insignificant, but in God's hands, it becomes exceptional. See, God can do things that we can only imagine. See, it's, it's like, it's like this, this, this water here. See, I, I put this up here because, nice dress, by the way, Jen. Good choice. If it's just me walking in the flesh, walking in the natural, then ba basically I can take this water here and pour it into an empty container. And all I'm doing is moving water into a different container. But when you walk in the power of God, come on, somebody. When you walk in the Holy Spirit, you got to remember that Jesus was at the mountaintop for 40 days and 40 nights shortly before all this happened. See, he was all excited, all fired up on, on, and all loaded with the Holy Spirit before he picked his disciples. And then they all went. See, but when you're walking in the anointing, everybody say anointing. When you're walking in the power of God, then you can take the common and make it uncommon. You can take this and begin to pour it in. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, come on, somebody. You see, the power of God and the anointing of God back then took water and made it into wine. I just made water into Kool-Aid. Come on, somebody. <laughs> come on, give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. But you get the message. See, God takes the simple things, things that we just use every day, and, then, and all of a sudden, he begins to use them in a supernatural way. And I think that's so important for us to understand as well. The greatest miracle, by the way, that you'll ever see in your life. And it happened because they invited Jesus. See, when you invite the right person into the house, something good happens. If you're the one invited, come on, somebody. See, God will put you in a situation where you turn out to be the answer to prayer. Where God begins to use you in a way. Somebody's praying for a need. All of a sudden, you show up, Johnny, on the spot. And God, on the person says, man, this is just exactly what I needed. I think the greatest miracle of all that we can all go through is when God uses us in someone else's miracle. The miracle of salvation, the miracle of healing, just praying for someone. You never know how God is going to use you. And that, to me, is such a powerful, powerful thing. And the last thing is this. That invitation created inspiration. It created inspiration. And I loved it. Verse 11, it says this. The beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. His disciples believed in him. Remember, this is Jesus' first tour. Come on, he just came out. He's nice, nice traveling with his disciples. The very first pit stop they make is in this wedding. So could you imagine what these guys are thinking at that point before he did this? I mean, we're following Jesus. We feel the presence of God when he talks. 
But this solidified their faith. The Bible says because they saw water turn into wine, come on somebody, they believed in him. And he needed disciples that believed. He needed men of God surrounding him that had faith to believe in what he was saying because he was just launching the ministry. And you see, I love this because the wine that Jesus replaced was better. Come on, somebody. Oh, come on. Listen to me. So many people say, Pastor Carlos, man, before I came to Jesus, I was this, and I had to give this up, and I had to give this up, and I had to give this up to come to Jesus. Listen, when you look at it carefully, you didn't give anything up. Come on, somebody. What you gained was so much more. Oh, uh, but I, used to, I, was, I was a rock star. I played the guitar. Yeah, you played the guitar in a bar with 20 drunks. Come on, somebody. At the end of the night, you're playing praise and worship on the platform. Listen, at the end of the day, what we gave up is nothing to what we gained. See, God gives us something better when he changes things around in our lives. And, and I love this. It says, you have kept a good wine until now. When I read that, I thought that was a prophetic introduction. That wasn't just, I mean, I mean he, he thought he was talking about the wine, but he was talking about Jesus. Jesus that just showed up. And you see, wine was used in the Old Testament as part of the covenant blessing. If you read the Old Testament, you'll see even in the, in the Psalms where it says, and, and, be, and they were blessed and the wine flowed and, and they added the wheat and the wine. and all. So it was a symbol of a blessing, of a covenant blessing to the point that when Israel was, was, um, was disobedient, the wine would not flow. So I believe that the wine we're talking about here, yes, it might be the physical wine, but it's the introduction of who Jesus is. See, at this point, we went from the law, come on somebody, from the dispensation of the law, because prior to Jesus showing up, it was about the law, and now we're going to the dispensation of grace. Now grace has stepped into the place. And when grace is in the place, it changes everything. It's not about rules and regulations anymore. It's about loving Jesus and loving one another. The Bible says, hey, they asked that question to Jesus, and that's it. Two things, love God, love each other. You got the whole Bible, you got the whole law. In those, that one sentence. Wow. And he said the new wine is here now. Wow. What an introduction. Hallelujah. Jesus, the son of God, launched his ministry at a wedding. Isn't that powerful? He started at a wedding. Because guess what? All of time ends at a wedding. Oh, come on, somebody. The bride and the groom are coming together one day. And we're going to have that, the, the supper. Come on, somebody. The marriage supper of the Lamb. The Bible says in that day we'll all be feasting with Jesus. He said, I started at a wedding. We're going to end at a wedding. And we're going to keep on rolling because you are my bride. He says he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Come on, somebody. You starch if you have to. I've worn a white shirt in forever, y'all. I got to tell you this. I put starch on this thing because I want it to be without spot or wrinkle. Come on, somebody. In case Jesus shows up right now. I'm kind of having fun with it, but it's real. We serve a good God. We serve a really good God. And today I hope that you know that God is a God of miracles. And if he did it back then, he can do it again. Come on. And the Bible says you have to do just one thing. Believe. Believe in God. But not just believe in him because the devil believes and he trembles. Everybody believes in God. But are you following him? Is he not just your savior, but is he your Lord? Amen. And if, if he is, come on, somebody. That second marriage we're going to be at is going to be a fun time, y'all. It's going to be a celebration. Hallelujah. If you believe that, put your hands together. Give the Lord a good praise. Come on, let's all stand to our feet here tonight or this morning.
So Pastor Carlos, how do I get my miracle? Number one, expect it. If God gave you the promise, expect it. You plant a seed in the ground, you water it, you expect to see a plant. Expect the miracle. God wants expectation is a sign of faith. Number two, visualize your miracle. Can you see it? Can you see a picture in your mind of what it looks like? You know, I believe that when you see something, it, it stirs up an emotion inside of you. When God spoke to Moses, he said, Moses, come here real quick. Look up to the sky. I'm going to draw a picture for you. You see all them stars? You're gonna, you're, your offspring is going to be greater than all those stars, more than all those stars in the sky. He drew a picture for him in his mind. I believe from that day forward, Moses would lay back and look up and go, whoa. Every night he went to bed looking at the stars. He was reminded of the promise. And of course, the last thing is this. Speak your miracle. Come on, somebody. Stop talking negative. Stop whining and complaining. Come on, somebody. Start speaking faith. Start speaking your miracle into effect. The Word of God says that we're created in His image. If we're in His image, when He spoke, God created the universe. When you speak, you create your universe. Your words make that impact. So right now, all over this house, just lift up your hands right now all over this house. Begin to praise Him. Begin to worship Him.